Good morning, Laidley Baptist Church, and welcome to Resurrection Sunday. He is risen. Hallelujah. In our communion time this morning, you will need some bread and a cup of juice. If you haven't got them already, go and get them now. We'll see you in just a minute. Hey, good morning. It's Resurrection Sunday morning. Hi, I'm Pastor Marshall. He is risen. What do you normally say back? He is risen indeed. Thank you, Yvonne. Hey, great to have you with us this morning. And I know it's early, 9.30, but guess what? We don't have to set up at the church. We can sit in our pajamas. Look, even I don't have shoes on. Look at that. How about that? Can you see that? Hey, that's pretty good. All right. Welcome to our communion service this morning. And uh, it's great that... Uh, Everyone around the world who's watching can be a part of this this morning. We want to welcome you into our home as we um, join and take communion together as the body of Christ. Even though we're online and we can't see one another, and even though the world is going crazy, most people, I guess, today on a Sunday as Christians, as believers, would be doing something like this, something very simple, taking communion together. And we're still a body of Christ together, whether we can see each other or not. We still can meet around the cross of Christ to remember and celebrate this unique story of sacrifice and salvation. Now, just like we have in front of us here, hopefully at home you should have some bread, like the one I'm holding up here. We've got um, unleavened bread, and uh, you should also have a cup of juice ready to go for the Lord's Supper meal. On Thursday night, um, just gone, we participated in our very first Passover meal hosted uh, by Celebrate Messiah, the very first online Passover meal. And there was lots of food and there was symbol, symbols and symbolic things uh, on the table. There was singing, there was readings, there was praise and worship, there was the Exodus story. But this simple meal that we have set before us today just has two elements. In the upper room in Jerusalem nearly 2,000 years ago, along with thousands of others who were visiting Jerusalem for the Passover festival, Jesus too was celebrating the Passover meal with his mates, his disciples. And he took two very simple items that were on the table as part of the meal, and he instructed his disciples about what would ultimately change the world and our lives forever. It was his sacrifice on the cross for sin, and that became known as the very first Lord's Supper. It's a remembrance meal for believers today. And Jesus said to remember him in this very special way, to remember his death doesn't mean to just pause for a few seconds and bring it to the front of your mind. To remember his death means to truly appreciate the significance of his death and the consequences in our lives. So the Passover meal recounts the story of the exodus of the Jewish nation from bondage in Egypt and it celebrates how humbly God's provision of salvation for them. And of course it's very symbolic. There's spotless lambs, there's blood on doorposts, there's different foods, there's bread without yeast, there's singing, there's reading. It's pretty full on and there's lots of symbolism involved. And so the celebration of the Passover meal acts as a reminder of what it is actually pointing towards, which was Jesus' redemption pathway for all people, both Jews and Gentiles, through this accomplishment, his accomplishment on the cross, where he defeated sin and death. This simple meal, the unleavened bread and the cup of the fruit of the vine we have set out here today, the Lord's Supper, points to the body of Christ that suffered on the cross. You might not be able to see it, but uh, on the bread it's pierced, if I hold it up, I can see the light through it, and it's striped to indicate that Jesus too was pierced, and by his stripes we are healed. The cup, the cup is a symbol of Christ's perfect blood, 
shed for the sins of the entire world, including ours. It's the perfect sacrifice, the only way to the Father. I'm going to get Yvonne to read something to you now as we, we, we listen to what I believe is the focal point, the whole story as we build it up for the resurrection uh, morning this morning. So Yvonne, would you like to read for us? Thank you. The room known as the Holy of Holies was the innermost and most sacred area of the ancient tabernacle of Moses and, and of the Temple of Jerusalem. The Holy of Holies was constructed as a perfect cube. It contained only the Ark of the Covenant, the symbol of Israel's special relationship with God. The Holy of Holies was accessible only to the Israelite high priest. Once a year, on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the high priest was permitted to enter the small, windowless enclosure to burn incense and sprinkle the blood of a sacrificial animal on the mercy seat of the Ark. By doing so, the high priest atoned for his own sins and those of the people. The Holy of Holies was separated from the rest of the tabernacle or temple by the veil, a huge, heavy drape made of fine linen and blue, purple and scarlet yarn and embroidered with gold cherubim. God said that he would appear in the Holy of Holies in Leviticus 16, hence the need for the veil. There exists a barrier between God and man. The holiness of God could not be accessed by anyone but the high priest, and then only once a year. God's eyes are too pure to look on evil. We find that in Habakkuk, Habakkuk 1. And he can tolerate no sin. The veil and the elaborate rituals undertaken by the priest were a reminder that man could not carelessly or irreverently enter God's awesome presence. Before the high priest entered the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement, he had to wash himself, put on special clothing, bring burning incense to let the smoke cover his eyes from a direct view of God, and bring sacrificial blood with him to make atonement for sin. That's found in Exodus 28 and Hebrews 9. The significance of the Holy of Holies to Christians is found in the events surrounding the crucifixion of Christ. When Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, an amazing thing happened. We read in Matthew 27, When Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, at that very moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The veil was not torn in half by any man. It was a supernatural event done by the power of God to make a very special point. Because of the death of Christ on the cross, man was no longer separated from God. No curtain, no veil, no incense smoke. The Old, Temp Old Testament temple system was made obsolete. It was rendered inoperative as the new covenant was ratified. No longer would we have to depend on priests to perform once a year sacrifices on our behalf. Christ's body was torn on the cross just as the veil was torn in the temple and now we have access to God through Jesus. In Hebrews 10 we read we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is, his body. The once, and for all, the once and for all time sacrifice of Christ did away with the necessity of yearly sacrifices, which could never take away sins. Those sacrifices were merely a foreshadowing of the perfect sacrifice to come, that of the Holy Lamb of God, Yeshua, slain for the sins of the world. The Holy of Holies, the very presence of God, is now open to all who come to Christ in faith. Where before 
there was an imposing barrier guarded by cherubim. God has opened a way by the shed blood of his son. Amen. Thanks, Yvonne. You know, it was all part of God's plan from the beginning to break down that middle wall of petition that divided Jews and Gentiles and to make all of us one together in the body of Christ. And so we are all one today in him. Amen. And it doesn't matter where we come from or, or you know, what's happening in our lives. We are all one together in the body of Christ. Our Christian communion meal has its biblical history in the ancient Jewish Passover meal. Jew and Gentile alike are welcomed together in the body of Christ as we recognize Jesus, Yeshua, as our, as our Messiah. As Gentiles, we are the wild olive shoots spoken of in Romans chapter 11, and we are partakers in the blessings bestowed upon the nation of Israel, the apple of God's eye. Romans 11:19 says this that we were we are the branch the branches were broken off so that we as gentiles could be grafted in. And so we're all partakers tonight of the blessings of the Jewish people. Or should I say today, not tonight. God's chosen people. We share together in a rich heritage with the people of Israel and all that God did to reveal himself to us through the ancient fathers of the faith, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the prophets and the festivals of Israel. This now becomes our heritage in Messiah. Jesus cleverly in the upper room uses the ancient national story of the Exodus and this ancient feast, the Passover, to proclaim a brand new covenant using the same theme, the offer of redemption, not just to a single nation anymore, but now to every person, to you and to me, all who gather here today. And God has woven into the fabric of the Exodus story a far greater redemption story. It's a picture of the Passover lamb, Jesus our Messiah. And there's a passage that speaks about this theme. And it says, uh, on the morrow, in John chapter 1, verse 29, he saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Of course, that was John the Baptist. And also in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 7, it says, He was oppressed. They're talking here about the Messiah. Yet when he was afflicted, he opened not his mouth as a lamb that is led to the slaughter and as a sheep that before its shearers is dumb. So he opened not his mouth. And so Jesus took the rich rituals of the Passover story and he uses it to open the eyes of the disciples. Here's his 12 mates that he's with. And he's opening their eyes to a brand new covenant. This covenant is going to be written in his blood. And in doing so, he opens our eyes today that he also becomes our Passover lamb. Because we believe in Jesus as the Lamb of God and our Messiah, and because we have in faith applied the blood of the sacrifice to the doorposts of our very hearts. When death comes to us, and inevitably it comes to every person, death will pass over us also because we have been given eternal life in Christ. Hallelujah. As at a designated point in the Jewish Passover meal, the master or the head of the house would take three pieces of matzah, or unleavened bread like we've got here today, and he put one whole piece of bread uh, that was flat bread uh, and he put it inside this particular bag. The bag is called the matzotosh. And the bread, as I said, is pierced and spiked and, and it is also striped. The sorts of things that the Messiah went through, pierced by the nails and the spear and striped by the way of the Roman whip. So the head of the house would take something like this, the matzotosh bag. It's a bag for the unleavened bread. And each piece goes into each separate section. So there's three sections here. And he'd put a piece into each of one of these sections. And each of these sections represent a unity. And the Jewish rabbis teach certain things about those, the, those three, these three compartments. But as Christians, as we look back through the lens of time to the Passover feast, we believe that it represents unity of our triune God. God the Father, Jesus the Son being the middle piece, and the Holy Spirit. And at a particular point 
in the Passover, the head or the master of the house, he would take the middle piece of the matzah out of this matzah tosh bag and he would take that middle piece and then he would break it into two. And then he would have another linen cloth bag similar to this called the afakumen bag. And he would put one of the pieces that he's just broken, he would put that into this linen afakumen bag. Afakumen just means it comes later. It's like in Greek it means, um, uh, the equivalent means it's dessert or it comes after. And what happens is this piece is an important piece in the Jewish feast. But concerning the middle piece of matzah, it's written in Luke 22 and verse 19, And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So in the middle of the Passover meal, Jesus does this, and he takes the, the piece and he breaks it in half. But in a normal Jewish household, it's hidden. Um, and then they have this big massive meal. Now the meal cannot continue, the end of it, until this bag is found again. There's a reward and the children go looking for it in the house. They'll tear the house apart to try and find it. And there's always a reward, a monetary reward. It's generally five or ten dollars for the kids. And uh, the first person who finds it gets the reward, which is really interesting because those who seek that middle piece of bread, the Jesus, the Son of God, those who seek Jesus, there is always a reward to be found. So the, the huge meal continues, lots of eating and drinking, it's a big feast. And at the end of the, the meal, when the children look for, for the Afakuman bag, um, the ransom price is paid by the head or the master of the house. And then the head and the master of the house takes out, as he continues the feast, he unwraps the Afakuman bag and he takes out that piece of matzah bread that came from the middle and he breaks it into pieces for everyone to have at the meal. This is what Jesus would have done with his disciples. Before he said that, and he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave them, gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. I'm not going to break up all of this into little pieces. I'll give that back to Yvonne there. So the ransom price is paid. Why is the middle piece broken? buried and brought back. Well, if the Matsatosh represents our triune God, then we know why. Jesus is that middle piece. Jesus, our Messiah. He's represented by the middle piece. He's broken, buried and brought back. That's the whole point of the gospel story. And it's because Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, was broken in death, wrapped in linen cloth and buried and hidden in the tomb and then brought back resurrected by the power of God, conquering sin and death. And it was this unleavened bread from the Afakuman bag that Jesus broke in the upper room and handed out to his disciples, saying, Take eat, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, at, this, at the upper room meal, he took the cup, and there's generally four cups that take place, four special cups during the Passover meal at various different points in the meal. But the New Testament tells us that Jesus took the cup after that they'd had the main meal, the main meal of the Passover. And so the cup that Jesus took was the cup directly after the meal, the cup of redemption, which is the third cup in the Passover meal. It's appropriate that that cup is called the cup of redemption. Jesus was very cleverly looking back to the redemption of Israel's freedom and looking forward to that redemption when Messiah comes. From the bondage of darkness and sin and sorrow and mourning, Jesus has brought us forth into freedom, joy, holiness and great light, a future hope and redemption. Hallelujah. Jesus has become our rescuer. In the upper room with his disciples, Jesus raises that third cup and he says, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for you for the remission, the forgiveness of sins. What new covenant was Jesus speaking about? It's recorded 
by the prophet in the prophet Jeremiah. It's a promise that God gives through the prophet Jeremiah. And he says in Jeremiah chapter 31, and there's four verses that follow, verses 31 to 34. He says, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. The problem with that covenant was that it was a broken covenant by Israel. But this is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. You see, the old covenant was written on tablets of stone, but the new covenant was to be written on our hearts. And God goes on to say, I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbour or say to anyone, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness, and I will remember their sins no more. So no longer would sin need to be atoned for or covered over through the old way, the old sacrifice in the temple, the sacrifice of the blood of animals. But now this once and for all God would deal with the human predicament of our sin. And so we find Jesus taking the bread and taking the cup after supper in that upper room with his 12 mates and telling these disciples that which you've all been waiting for, that which you've been promised, that the new covenant has now come in my blood. Now, after taking the Passover meal for so many years, I'm guessing that it runs the risk of losing its, its meaning, its appeal. Perhaps it just becomes this boring tradition. But then one day, in an upper room in Jerusalem, we see its very fulfilment. And it all starts to make sense. Imagine God weaving into the fabric of that very first Passover, the Passover in Egypt, in, 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 in Exodus, the greatest picture, the picture of not only the redemption of Egypt, but the redemption of it from our sin all the way through to the Passover Lamb in Jesus, our Messiah. And in that redemption, you and I partake today. If we know Christ as our Saviour, if we have by faith applied the blood of His sacrifice to the doorposts of our hearts, then Jesus is our Passover Lamb. Hallelujah that we have been redeemed by the precious blood of the Passover Lamb of God. I'm going to give thanks for the bread and for the cup. And after I've done that, we're going to partake in this very special, but simple, but special, very amazing meal that, that we have been left by Jesus. Let's pray. Gracious and Heavenly Father, we thank you for these two emblems today. But they represent something incredible. For the life of every single person that has ever lived. And I pray today, Lord, that we would recognise on this very special Resurrection Sunday morning what these two symbols are. The symbol of your body, of, uh, the, the body of your son, Jesus, broken on the cross, given as a sacrifice. And the cup, a symbol, a representation of Jesus' blood. The blood that can forgive every sin in our lives. We take these two symbols humbly. We ask in Jesus' name that you would reveal your son Jesus even more. We ask today, Lord, that you would reveal your son Jesus to us, that he is risen, that we serve a risen Saviour, and we remember that through the partaking of this meal. Father, make it very special to us today, particularly as we're in lockdown. For a world that's drawn away from you, Lord, that they would draw near to you, that many people would come through the internet, through social media, that they would start to understand that their salvation is nigh. Lord, we thank you for the, the privilege of sharing this today, to be the body of Christ together. We thank you that we have salvation through the shed blood of Jesus. We thank you in the precious name of our risen Saviour, Jesus. Amen. As we... Um, Take the bread. We're going to take it in our own time. 
So if you've got your bread at home, please take it. Reflect on the sacrifice of the cross. Picture in your own mind's eye the cross and Jesus' body and what he went through for each one of us. Let's take the bread together. If you have your cup there, hold it in your hand. Reflect on the fact that without blood there can be no forgiveness. That it was the perfect blood of the perfect sacrifice. The perfect Lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world. This is a very special time and a very special moment that we remember what Jesus has done. That he shed his life, his life for ours, a beautiful exchange. Mm. Let's drink together as we celebrate that the grave could not hold Jesus, that he has risen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We thank you, Father, for the freedom that we have through Jesus. We thank you for the redemption that you have given to us, that while we were a long way away, that you died for us. We thank you that we don't have to do anything, that only by your grace that we can accept through faith that Jesus was born. He died on the cross for our sin, was buried and rose on the third day. And for any one of us who believes that, that Jesus is the Son of God, that he has truly done, what I've just said, that if we believe in that, that you have given us life, life abundant and life eternal. No COVID virus can touch the eternal life that you have given to us. Father, just bless your people today, both listening to this video and all around the world, wherever they might be, as they celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. We thank you. We look forward to the rest of the day. May it be a day filled with joy, with singing, with praise and worship for what you have done in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. As we conclude the Lord's Supper, can I remember, uh, or can you remember, if possible, to pray for the salvation of God's people, the nation of Israel. The book of Revelation and the prophets state that their salvation is a prerequisite, a precondition for the return of the Messiah. So please pray for the peace and the protection of Jerusalem and the people of Israel as instructed in Psalm 122 verse 6. You and I are to be watchmen and watchwomen as per Isaiah 62 verse 1. For Zion's sake... I will not remain quiet until her vindication shines out like the dawn, her salvation like a blazing torch. Even the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 1 verse 10 urges us and he says, Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they too may be saved. Well, thank you for joining us today in this very special time. Later on today... I'll have my Resurrection Sunday message up online and it's a great message. It's got some encouraging media clips that actually relate to the COVID virus as well. And I hope that you'll, cho uh, you'll choose to join me as I open up God's Word a little later on in this amazing morning, the Resurrection morning. Feel free to share these clips, the YouTube clips, with your friends and family so that they can hear the great news uh, on this uh, Easter about Jesus. So thanks for joining us today around the Lord's table. I pray that it's been a wonderful time, probably a quiet time maybe uh, in your own homes, just uh, spending time with the Lord. I pray it's been a special resurrection remembrance for both you and your family. Rejoice, for we have been set free by the blood of Jesus Christ. The grave could not hold him. 
He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.